You are listening to Retirement Lifestyle Advocates Radio. I'm your host, Dennis Tubergen. Glad you decided to tune in today. Hey, I have a terrific first-time guest on the program today. I found the interview that I did this past week with him absolutely fascinating. Uh, Dr. Charles Nenner uh, joined me this past week from his home in the Netherlands. Uh, Dr. Nenner is a very interesting guy. He is a cycles expert and has an extensive uh, background with Goldman Sachs and with his own research firm. Uh, I know you're going to, again, enjoy my conversation with him. That will be in the second segment of today's program. And he has some rather interesting and very eye-opening predictions, so stay tuned for that. I want to remind you that if you are a new listener, this is all about education. To that end, we do have some resources available for you at our website, the Retirement Lifestyle Advocates website. It's retirementlifestyleadvocates.com. You can listen to past programs of RLA Radio. You can also sign up for our weekly newsletter titled Portfolio Watch, and that is free. It's delivered every Monday at 5. I would encourage you to go to the website and subscribe. Again, the website is Retirement Lifestyle Advocates. Dot com. You know, I, uh, back in 2015, uh, wrote a book called New Retirement Rules, and we have done many events and uh, made the book available over the past five years here. And in the book, I in- introduced uh, some research that I did really based on other people's research, other experts' research uh, on the Dow to gold ratio. And I want to talk to you a bit about this ratio in this segment and a bit in the last segment of today's program because, in my view, uh, it's a terrific way to forecast long-term movements in both stocks and in gold. Well, the Dow to gold ratio, quite simply, is the value of the Dow Jones Industrial Average divided by the price of gold per ounce. Now, presently, that number stands between 14 and 15 as I record this. So if you take a look at the value of the Dow and divide by the price of gold per ounce, you'll come up with a number somewhere between 14 and 15. Now, I stand by my prediction of five years ago that we will see the Dow to gold ratio go to two, perhaps even one. Now, when I made the forecast in the book, it seemed radical. But now, given current events, it seems a lot more realistic, and it seems like there is a path by which we will get there. Now, the policy of the Federal Reserve, which is enormous quantities of new money creation, will have to eventually lead to inflation if it continues at its current pace. That will be bullish for gold, but as I talk about with Dr. Nenner in the next segment, there are many times historically that gold bull markets have taken place in a deflationary environment. It's a very interesting perspective. And if one looks around the world, individuals worldwide as well as foreign governments are already beginning to seriously question the role of the U.S. dollar as a world reserve currency moving ahead. Now, a side point to this is that as currencies evolve and as money is created out of thin air, the wealth gap will widen. I mentioned this in the 2015 book as well. Massive amounts of money creation tends to benefit those who are closest to the money creation machine or the proverbial printing press. The further away from the printing press you are, the less you benefit from this policy. That creates a wealth gap. And when you couple this widening wealth gap with beaten down economies that likely will not recover as quickly as many hope, we will likely see more geopolitical tensions and social unrest. Now, David Morgan, who is a recognized silver expert, made this comment, and it is 
profound. He said you cannot have true peace and prosperity unless you can absolutely trust the money. And when you have massive quantities of money creation, should it continue at these levels, you will reach a point that there will be significant, massive, and growing distrust of the money. And that makes the case for higher gold. That makes the case or help makes the case for a Dow to gold ratio of two or perhaps even one. And to put that in number terms, as crazy as that sounds, it would mean the Dow at 10,000 and gold at 5,000. Or perhaps the Dow at 5,000 and gold at 5,000. And yes, I will go on record as saying that I am forecasting the Dow to go below 10,000. Now, it's really no accident, as I make the case for this Dow to gold ratio, that relative free markets and a stable dollar tied to gold through 1971 resulted in America becoming the most prosperous country in the world. Now, this has certainly become less true since the dollar has been no longer redeemable for gold since August of 1971. And we're starting to see a slide in the dollar against other world currencies. You know, through May or so, the dollar was holding up really well against other currencies, although it was still trailing gold as evidenced by the price of gold. If you take a look at the four weeks ending mid-June, the dollar lost 3% against the euro, the Denmark krona, and the Canadian dollar. I should say between 3 and 4%. The dollar loss, the U.S. dollar loss between 4 and 6%, to the Indonesian currency, the New Zealand dollar, and the Swedish krona. The U.S. dollar lost between 7 and 8% to the Brazilian real, the Australian dollar, the Russian ruble, the Colombian peso, and the South African rand. The dollar lost more than 10% to the Mexican peso and to platinum, 13% to palladium, and 21% to silver. The dollar did not have a good month, and I would argue and make the point, and common sense would dictate that the dollar didn't have a good month because there was a lot of new dollars being created. Now, you have to keep in mind that markets rarely go straight up and markets rarely go straight down, so I wouldn't be surprised to see a dollar rally and a metals decline giving the magnitude of the dollar's decline over this time frame. However, I would at this point view declines in metals prices to be counter-trend at this point, given current, given current monetary policies. And if you look around the world, as we'll talk about in the last segment of today's program, signs of low confidence in the U.S. dollar continue to emerge. And in my view, gold will be at least one alternative to the U.S. dollar. That certainly bolsters the case of getting the Dow to gold ratio to two, or perhaps even one. Now, if you're just joining us uh, in this segment, I want to close again this segment by reminding you that there are plenty of free resources at our website, retirementlifestyleadvocates.com. And also want to thank everybody for making uh, my most recent book, Revenue Sourcing, a number one bestseller on Amazon in four different categories. Uh, The book is available at Amazon, or you can go to retirementlifestyleadvocates.com forward slash books to get your copy. That's retirementlifestyleadvocates.com forward slash books. I'll be back after these words with my special guest, Dr. Charles Nenner. Welcome to RLA Radio. I am your host, Dennis Tubergen. I'm very pleased to have joining me on today's program, first-time guest here on RLA Radio, Dr. Charles Nenner. Uh, In 2001, uh, Dr. Nenner founded and is president of the Charles Nenner Research Center. Uh, He's provided his independent market research to hedge funds, banks, brokerage firms, individual clients, and family offices. You can learn more about his work at charlesnenner.com. 
and he's offering our listeners a free trial to check out his work as well. Uh, Dr. Nenner, prior to founding the firm, uh, worked with Goldman Sachs in New York, and uh, he has uh, uh, joining, he's joining us today from his home in the Netherlands. And uh, Dr. Nenner, welcome to the program. Well, nice to be here. After such an, uh, an introduction, I'm, I'm interested to know what I'm going to say myself. <laughs> well, we are as well, so that's great. Uh, let's start with with your work, uh, Dr. Nenner. You spend uh, your days researching cycles. Can you explain to our listeners what exactly that means? Well, the whole thing started uh, after I finished medical school, and I was participating in a, in a, in a research about psychotic patients, and we wanted to know if there was a regular uh, time between the, the, the outbreak of psychiatric uh, patients all over the world. And we found out that, indeed, all over the world, uh, every so many months or every so many uh, quarters, uh, a lot of people become uh, psychotic. Now, we knew that already because you probably know that when it's full moon, a lot of women give birth, so we already knew that you had better have a big staff when it's full moon. Nobody knows why that is, but it's also a cycle. Uh, so I did everything by hand, and uh, I start looking then from a deterministic point of view uh, at the world that things don't happen at random. In the middle, uh, in the beginning of the 80s, uh, um, the computer started, and then I wrote a computer program that is the cycle program actually, and that has not changed since then. Now, what is a cycle program? So the the, the big cycles and short cycles, let's say you got the uh, 11 year inventory cycle, you got a four year uh, sun cycle, you got all kinds of cycles, and they come with a regular inter, inter, interval. So um, the problem is that sometimes one is up and three are down, and one is up and one is neutral, so what do you do? So then you have to write a program that the computer can make an end result, and then the computer can really figure out what the day of a low is and what the day of a high is. Then I came to the idea that uh, maybe prices don't move at random. That means is if IBM goes up with a certain momentum, maybe you can calculate how high it will go. And this is all independent of, of, of news items. Uh, the idea is if, if it would be at, at random, then you can never figure out anything. But if it's not at random, you have to look how it works. Now, I was on Dutch television, happened to be there yesterday, and I showed them two graphs. One was the Bitcoin that we do very intensely, and uh, one was the Dow Jones cycles. And the interesting thing is that the cycle works perfectly for the Bitcoin and also for the Dow Jones. So my argument was, is there's almost no fundamental research on Bitcoin, and it's not that, you know, at 10 past 9, uh, some news item comes out that you can relate to why the Bitcoin goes up and down. So that is acceptable. But then when it's a Dow Jones, suddenly people think, oh, this has to do with research and, and the cash flows and whatever. And that says if I was, would switch the charts, then you would know what one is Bitcoin and Dow Jones. So stop looking at all these so-called old-fashioned uh, ways of uh, interpreting the market and just try to decide things don't move at random and then you check out what happens, when it happens, and at what level it happens. So the, the big thing was uh, we got in 0% cash in, in February uh, when everybody was actually mentioning there could be a black swan incident. Now, the black swan incident, as you know, is that means that something happens that was unexpected. So already done, then I wrote, stop thinking what it could be and start uh, thinking when it's going to be. So my, my system can say when it's going to be and not what. So in this case, it was the virus. could have been something else. So my system deals with what's going to happen and not so much why it's going to happen. You know, I, I uh, sought you out for an interview because I saw you uh, saw an interview on another program, and uh, I was impressed that uh, – you had actually called that a big event was going to happen. Obviously, you had no way to foresee what it was, but what would you say to our listeners that maybe are listening to this and 
they seem skeptical. Uh, why do cycles exist? Does it have to do with human behavior? Does it have to do with uh, the laws of nature? I mean, what would be the what would you say to someone who's skeptical? Well, first of all, uh, exactly what you said. It has to do with human behavior, and especially if there's mass psychology involved, which is in in in, in the market, um, hundreds of millions of people involved. There's no free choice. They're all uh, interact with each other. And the other idea is, listen, if you don't believe it's pre it's predictable by such a system, then I always ask people, so how do you invest? Uh, it's much easier to, uh, to, uh, to check a system that says, I give you the exact dates and exact levels than to say, I don't know what's going on. I mean, if you're sick, you don't go to a doctor who says, well, you know, anything could happen. I don't know. You go to a doctor who says, I know exactly what your problem is. Um, it has to do a little bit with the, what's going on in society that nothing is clear anymore. Uh, we have uh, what's politically correct, so nobody can say what's true, what's not true, and that influences your mind also. So people find it very hard to decide when something is true or not. Um, the only thing I can say is I did all the research for the prop trading of Goldman Sachs, that is the, uh, the, the investment of the money that Goldman Sachs does for himself. And if that was good enough, uh, I think that uh, they can take uh, another look because if these people would 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 ask you know or you would ask them would you like to know what Goldman Sachs says what's going to happen tomorrow in the market they probably would say yes. Uh, uh, but in this case, uh, it, it's a little bit more complicated. Is uh, it needs a basis of mathematics and physics and quantum physics in order really to appreciate what's going on. So. Dr. Nenner, um, are these cycles uh, macro cycles over over long time frames? Are, are they are they more accurate over longer time frames, or are they applicable also to shorter time frames? Uh, any time frame we do, uh, we update four times a week and intraday. So if we can even tell you intraday uh, how high the, the the market is going and what time is going to top and how many hours it goes down. We call it hourly cycles. And it's the same same system as uh, quarterly or yearly cycles. Well, if you're just joining us, we're chatting today with Dr. Charles Nenner. The website is charlesnenner.com. And if you'd like to go check out his work, uh, which I would encourage you to do, uh, you can get a free trial uh, because you're an RLA radio listener. So, uh, this is fascinating stuff, uh, Dr. Nenner. Do these cycles apply to things other than financial markets? Are there such things as political cycles and, and things like that? Yeah, definitely. I, I used to uh, do research for uh, two interesting uh, situations. One is was in Hong Kong for people who are fashion designers, and they want to be prepared, so they want to know what the fashion is in one or two years. Let's take something very interesting for men. You know, can have a single-breasted or double-breasted suit. Now, if you would look at the history, you see that every so many years, it is double-breasted again, and then it changes again. Now, if you know the cycle, then you can prepare yourself and be right on the fashion and have a, have a big business. And the other thing we did was we worked for uh, for record companies. Uh, they sometimes want to bring out hits from the past. And then they want to know who should sing it, a man, a woman, should to bring it out in the summer, in the spring, in the winter. And then you build a cycle and you'll be surprised that if it, just give an example, if they would bring it out in the winter, not in the summer, it's not a hit. And if they do it in the summer, it's going to be a hit. So it's applicable to all kinds of uh, situations. And uh, uh, especially my war cycles uh, that, uh, so... I, I, I figured out, not I figured out, but I did some research about wars, uh, and I give you one simple example. There is a, a, a war cycle uh, that says every second decade of a new century, it starts to be very dangerous for war. So that's right now. And if you go back 100 years, it's the First World War. And if you go back, then you go to the time of Napoleon. And if you go back, so if you... Just sit in your computer and say, and you Google, and you Google uh, big wars around uh, change of the century, you'll find it going back 1,500 years. Now, I have no clue why there's always in a second decade 
of, of a new century. Uh, or, for instance, you've got the 60-year social cycle. So that's why now after the 60s, 16 years passed, and now that's why we have all this social unrest, which is going to be much worse, just because there's a cycle of 60 years. So you can you can understand the world much better if you don't think that things happen at random, because then you can do anything. Uh, you just have to do your work. So you mentioned the social unrest cycle of 60 years. So when you see this, and you made a comment that it's going to get much worse, and uh, for our listeners, we're going to get to financial markets. I find this to be just fascinating. So how long does this period of social unrest last? And you say it's going to get more intense. It's going to get worse. Yes, well, it can, it can, at least, it can, it can last 10 years, according to cycles. And it, it just started. Because if you have to see what happened in the 60s, it started to explode, you know, with the uh, uh, protests against Vietnam and, and the student being killed. Uh, it was a big mess. And already now, it's interesting. I don't, I don't know in the United States, but today in Europe, the last couple of days, there are physical fights that the police has to stop between people who want a lockdown and people who don't want a lockdown. So they, they protest on both sides and they start, start to, you know, uh, physically attacking each other. So it's a big unrest. So let's talk a little bit, and we've got just a couple of minutes left in this segment. Yeah. So can, can you talk about the financial market since uh, many of our listeners are preparing for retirement, they, they're, they, they're working toward financial independence. So what type of financial markets, what, what financial markets do you apply these cycles to? Well, we play it up and we play it down, so that's simple. Uh, so we went in zero uh, stocks uh, just before the top, uh, and then we played the bounce. And just now, this week, we're going totally out of stocks again because cycles are close to uh, to topping again. Uh, I show people an overlay of the 1929 crash and the situation 73, 74, and the situation 2000. And instead of people making uh, interpretations why you have this big bounce, they should see that almost always it goes like this. And my long-term, and I hope you're sitting down, my long-term downside price target for the Dow, it hasn't been there for the last 10 years, is around 5,000. So you have to be safe. Now, the, the other problem is that we're close to a low in interest rates. So if you be in bonds or you buy bonds, you're going to lose a lot of capital also. Uh, so in a situation that is very, very difficult uh, to know what to do. So mostly we we are investing in gold already since uh, 2011, 2012. And gold should have a bull market for the next, for another six years or so. Well, absolutely fascinating. Um, our guest today is Dr. Charles Nenner. He is the founder of the Charles Nenner Research Center. You can go to charlesnenner.com. That's Charles Nenner is spelled N-E-N-N-E-R, charlesnenner.com. You can get a free trial and check out his work. Uh, the good news is I've got one more segment to chat with Dr. Nenner, which I will do after these words. Stay with us. Welcome back to RLA Radio. I'm your host, Dennis Tuberg, and I have the pleasure today of chatting with Dr. Charles Nenner. Uh, Dr. Nenner is the founder of the Charles Nenner Research Center. Uh, he is an expert on cycles. Uh, he actually uh, worked with Goldman Sachs in uh, New York. Uh, he uh, actually does 100% of his time is spent doing research now, and he's had as clients uh, hedge funds, banks, brokerage firms, family offices, and a very interesting guy. So if you're just joining us, go check out Dr. Nenner's website at charlesnenner.com, where you can also get a free trial. And uh, mention RLA Radio if you like his service, and he will give you a discount. So... Dr. Nenner, let's just jump in and talk about stocks because you said something that I'm sure many of our listeners found shocking in the last segment, that you think the Dow will go to 5,000. Um, I've done some research with other guests on the radio program in the past, and uh, I've thought that we would see the Dow to gold ratio reach parity. In other words, if the Dow goes to 5,000, gold goes to 5,000. Sounds like, sounds like we might have taken two different roads to arrive at the same point. What would you say? Well, I don't look at the parity. I don't even know about that, so it doesn't bother me. <laughs> so, so I don't know. <laughs> but but there's something very interesting going on. We sent Sunday, we sent out a chart that shows that every time that the market tops, 
the earnings uh, forecast for the S&P also go down. And the funny thing is the earnings forecast is totally collapsing while the, 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 the markets are going up for the last couple of months. I've never seen something like that, and this cannot end well. And especially if you look who's investing, uh, you know, uh, the same is in the United States as in, 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 here in Holland. Uh, 100,000 people have never been in the market are now going into the market because uh, they missed the upturn in, to, in 2008, 2009. So they say it's not going to happen to me again. And that's why the small investor usually is on the wrong side of the market. So what do you see as a, a, a time frame to have the Dow go to 5,000? Yeah, we're looking for the end of 2021. So we're, we're in for no, a it, big, it, intense it, it leg looked, down. It looked, it looked strange, but now we can imagine if the virus does uh, come again, and I, I'm 99% sure it comes again based on cycles, here you go again, and the whole economy drops that, then we might think that really we go to 5,000. Now, when I said it 10 years ago, it sounds strange. But now we have a clue what could happen. So as the Dow drops to 5,000, um, you mentioned that bonds with interest rates at a low point are also uh, a trap for investors. Uh, U.S. Treasuries have always been a safe haven, and the U.S. dollar has always been a safe haven. How do you see that playing out? Yeah, first of all, I want to mention that that was in the, in the Clinton era, the, that was 5,000, and the world still looked reasonable, so it doesn't mean we're going under. Uh, there could be a liquidity crisis, although the economy is very weak. What happened in, 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 uh, in Europe, in Greece, Italy, Portugal, and then interest rates shoot up for technical reasons, not because the economy is weak. So you look for... Ye interest rates and, and yields on U.S. Treasuries to to spike at some point in the future. Yeah, they never, they will not spike. They will start going up for the next couple of years. Finally, not that there's inflation because I still see deflation. So it must be that there's going to be a liquidity crisis or a lack of trust or something. Interesting. So let's talk about metals. Uh, you had mentioned in the last segment that you're you're bullish on gold. Talk, if you would, in some detail about the gold cycle. Well, the gold cycle uh, bottomed in uh, in November 2011. That's when for long-term investors we went long. For short-term investors, we you know gold is nice. It goes up hundred dollars, down the hundred dollars, and we play it uh, very nicely. Um, and the, the long-term cycle is up till 2026. My first price target has been already for many years two and a half thousand. Uh, but I think it will probably go much higher because if the bull market goes up to 2026 uh, and we're already at 1800, uh, there must be a much higher price target. Otherwise, nothing is going to happen for for many years. So as the Dow collapses, then uh, you're seeing gold as the, the only safe haven at this point? Am I, am I understanding what your, your logic is correctly? Well, the problem with deflation, and I think it's going to be deflation, is that uh, you know companies uh, don't make uh, any money. Uh, it's very simple to explain. You, you make a product, and by the time you sell the product, the value is less than what you made it for. Uh, you can have a liquidity crisis, the white bonds are going down. Now, what you're left is real estate, which will also go down. Uh, but, uh, you know, a lot of people then uh, don't know what to do. So they buy gold. At least they have something, especially uh, uh, short-term rates are not going up that much. Long-term rates are going up. So uh, they call it a safe haven, but it's not actually because of that. It's just that people don't know what to invest in anymore. Dr. Nenner, when you say you expect deflation and yet you're you're uh, forecasting a bull market in gold, those two statements right. seem to be at odds with each other. That's interesting. Everybody says that, but if you look at the research, you say you see that 50% of bull markets in gold were in deflationary periods. It's what people remember that gold uh, has to do with inflation, but if you look for the last three, four, five hundred years, it's always deflation that leads to uh, bull markets in gold. So, Dr. Nenner, when, with, with all the money creation going on around the world, uh, do you see any scenario under which we don't have deflation, but we have a hyperinflationary outcome? Well, you know, you ask me these things, and I always want to, it might go up in time, uh, 
time uh, when I had the position, I said, listen, I know much as much as you guys. I'm not specifically more uh, educated. Uh, and actually, I don't deal with that. I deal with what's going to happen and when it's going to happen. Uh, the hyperinflation is going to be, but only after we have a deflationary crisis. Understood. So let's talk a little bit about, this is an election year here in the United States. I know you mentioned before we recorded today that you split your time between the United States and uh, the Netherlands and Israel. Uh, how do you see uh, the political cycle affecting the upcoming elections here in the United States this year? Well, first of all, I want to mention there's a long-term cycle. Some people call it the Kondrashev cycle. Uh, that says every so many years, and he calls it 50, 50, 60, 70 years, uh, uh, a new era starts in a different place. So uh, in this case, Europe is already uh, in the middle. Uh, United States is going down and the East is going up. So all the economic uh, activity for the next 10, 20, 30 years is going to be in Singapore, China, Australia, over there. Uh, first of all, it's important for the Americans to understand what the position is. Now, can you change it according to my cycles? You can't change it. Whatever you do, that's what's going to happen. Uh, second of all, um, there is an interesting thing is that when interest rates are going up, and it seems illogical, then usually the party in the White House continues to be in the White House. So that has been out nine out of ten times as we're going on. So we have to see when interest rates start going up. Um, that much I can tell you now, looking here from a European point of view, well, look what's going on. And to us, it's amazing what's going on and the candidates that are there for 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 politics. Uh, I guess after what they did to the uh, uh, appointment of judges, and who knows what, that nobody in his right mind who has talent wants to be in politics anymore. Because if you said one wrong word 30 years ago at school, you know, you probably have been published and you don't get the job. So the level goes down and down and down, according to the United States. And uh, I don't know how this is going to end, but I, it's a big problem. Yeah, so giving take, take somebody who has money in a retirement account. They're managing a, their own personal pension, a 401k. Uh, what advice would you have for someone like that based on your cycle research? There's not much you can do. Go in cash and take some, some uh, not totally, but take a small position in, in gold. Because I, remember, I, you know, I remember the saying we had one in gold for sex in 1929. Cash went up 900%. Why? Because the stock market went down. And if you had cash, you were king. There is a, a, the difference between a Dutch person that I am and an American person is, American says, how can we make money? And a Dutch person is, how can we not lose money? <laughs> and this is a situation where, where you have to try not to lose money, even if you cannot have rate of return. Don't don't take chances. Don't gamble, uh, especially you know if you're older and you you have to live on your retirement because it's not going to end well. So when uh, when you look at uh, the the world um, and and you look at the the the, the, the stocks will be affected. Uh, do you, do you see then in 2021, 2022, do your cycles say that we're going to have the stock buying opportunity of a lifetime? And is, is there some good news at the end of this? Well, it's not it's not going to be the buying of a lifetime. I think we're going to have the same situation as what happened in Japan. Japan topped in 1980, went down in waves, and then along the bottom has been going on for 20 years. So what's going to happen is we're going to hit the bottom. And then for 10, 20 years, not much is going to happen. Uh, which, which, you know, did, we, we, I, I gave you one example. Brokers will tell you stocks go up around 7 8% a year, right? Right. Now, how do they get to that? They take from 1900, they, take, they make a line with an angle of 7 8%. And it says, okay, now the problem is, if you look at that line, if you can visualize what I'm saying is, we're trading about 50% above that line. So in order to get back to the line, we have to go 50% below the line, and then we're back to an average of 7%. So if you're 50% above the average of 7 8%, how can you ever say stocks will go up for 7 8%? So it has to happen in order to get back for that, you know, from the beginning of 1900, to make an average of 7 8%. There's just nothing we can do about it. Now, what is going to trigger it? Maybe a virus, maybe something else, maybe a war. 
That I don't know. I just know that is going to happen. And in the newspapers, we'll read, you know, next year why it happened. Well, it's certainly been a fascinating conversation today. My guest today has been Dr. Charles Nenner. Uh, his website is charlesnenner.com. You can go there and sign up for a free trial. I'd encourage you to do that. And uh, Dr. Nenner, thanks so much for joining us today. I know it's late in the Netherlands as we're recording this, but uh, really enjoyed the conversation. Would love to have you back down the road. Okay, we'll, we'll do it again. We will return after these words. I am Dennis Tubergen. You are listening to RLA Radio. Thanks again to Dr. Charles Nenner for joining me on today's program. You know, Dr. Nenner and I used two different methodologies to come to the same conclusion. And in the first segment of today's program, I talked about the fact that five years ago, I predicted in the book New Retirement Rules that we would see a Dow to gold ratio of two or one. And if you're just joining the, joining us, here's what that means. It means that if you take the value of the Dow and divide by the price of gold per ounce in U.S. dollars, you get a number of two or one. That would mean the Dow would be at 10,000, gold would be at 5,000, or perhaps even both at 5,000. Now, the case for higher gold is a fairly easy one to make, given that the rest of the world is now looking at the monetary policy of the United States. And to be fair, it's just not the United States engaging in massive amounts of money printing. But the U.S. dollar is really getting some attention. Just last week, the chair of the Chinese Banking and Insurance Regulatory Commission, a gentleman by the name of Mr. Xu King, delivered a warning about the U.S. dollar. Now, this speech was given in Shanghai, and Mr. Xu King made four points. Number one, the Federal Reserve, the U.S. Federal Reserve, is the de facto central bank of the world. When the policy of the central bank targets its own economy without considering spillover side effects, Mr. Xu King says the Fed is very likely, very likely to overdraft the credit of the dollar and the United States. Two, the pandemic may be around for a long time. Countries around the world keep throwing money at it with diminished impact. Mr. Xu King advised that countries think twice and reserve some policy space for the future. Three, money printing will cause future economic turmoil. Mr. Xu King correctly points out there is no free lunch. He suggests we watch out for inflation. Four, financial markets, in particular stocks, are disconnected from the real economy, and these distortions are unprecedented. Mr. Xu King noted it's going to get really painful when the policy withdrawal begins. That makes the argument for lower stocks. Now, Mr. Xu King said this. He said, China cherishes the conventional monetary and fiscal policies very much. We will not engage in flooding the system. What does that mean? We will not engage in massive money printing, nor will we engage in deficit monetization. What does that mean? We're not going to print money to balance our budgets. Now, Mr. Xu King also kind of took a stab at U.S. monetary policy. He said this, some people say domestic debt is not debt, so money that you owe to yourself is perhaps not debt. But external debt is debt. So one arm of the U.S. government owing another arm money, some would argue, is not debt. But money owed to China or Japan is debt. Mr. Xu King said, for the United States, it seems that even external debt is not debt. In other words, they're not paying attention to their debt. They're not respecting their creditors. He says, this seems to have been the case for quite some time in the past. But can it really last for a long time into the future? Interesting to know what he's thinking. Stephen Roach, who is the former chairman of Morgan Stanley Asia, made these comments. He said that the dollar's dominance faces major threats as the post-pandemic economy emerges. He said the currency has survived attacks from a trade war and the start of the coronavirus outbreak, but yet, as I talked about in the first segment of today's program, 
The dollar's winning streak has faded in recent weeks as investors prepare for record borrowing to fund trillions of dollars of fiscal and monetary stimulus. So this argument for a weaker dollar and higher gold prices is a very solid one. Gold rising to $3,000 an ounce or $5,000 an ounce, whatever the number happens to be as stocks fall to a similar level, is not an unrealistic expectation. Now, at the same time, the argument for much lower stock prices is also an easy argument to make given current stock valuation levels. In fact, as you heard from Dr. Nenner today, he is expecting, based on his cycle research, the Dow to go to 5,000. I believe the Dow goes under 10,000. That's where using a two-bucket approach to manage your assets is important. And if you haven't looked at this, I would encourage you to begin immediately. Economic conditions that we talked about five years ago and talked about them here on the radio, and we predicted they would appear, are now appearing. If you're not familiar with the two-bucket approach, You'll want to get a copy of the book, Revenue Sourcing. And to do that, you can go to retirementlifestyleadvocates.com forward slash books, retirementlifestyleadvocates.com forward slash books, and you can get a copy uh, uh, following the instructions that are there. So when we take a look at what this revenue sourcing methodology is, Basically, we're dividing assets up into two buckets of money. We're suggesting that you need one bucket to protect yourself from a stock market decline. And if stocks don't happen to decline, if we're completely wrong about this, the two-bucket approach might have you missing some upside, but it would have you not participating in potential downside. At the same time, we don't know when or if massive amounts of money printing will tip the deflation that we're now seeing emerging into inflation. If that happens, we need to have a hedge to protect against that as well. And in the Revenue Sourcing book, we talk about many times in history when countries have faced similar scenarios and when studying history, it's interesting to learn and discover how the outcome has almost always been the same. In the book, I include a quote from Abba Iban. Here's what he said. History teaches us that men and nations behave wisely once they've exhausted all other alternatives. History teaches us that men and nations behave wisely once they've exhausted all other alternatives. There's a lot of truth to that when one studies history. So, If you haven't yet gotten a copy of the Revenue Sourcing book, I'd encourage you to do that. There's a great offer at retirementlifestyleadvocates.com forward slash books. And at Retirement Lifestyle Advocates website, you can also listen to any of the interviews that we conduct here on the program. Uh, You can go back and listen to the interview that I did with uh, Dr. Nenner today. Uh, They are posted there every Monday at 5 o'clock. You can also sign up for our Portfolio Watch newsletter, which is delivered once a week. It's free. It's delivered to your inbox every Monday night at 5. That's all the time I have for my program this week. I hope you got something you can use. I'll be back again next week.